All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we should just dive in, I think. Let's do cool. it. Let's dive, dive in. into the deep end of the pool on this. Uh, we're here to talk about Hand to God, which I've seen three or four times in different incarnations. And just for the benefit of people who may not have seen it, how would you describe? Give me the, the two sentence pitch on this show. It's, uh, it's an age old story about a boy meeting a demonically possessed sock puppet. <laughs> they fall in love. It's about a kid who needs a charge for his phone. You're right, right. It's about that too. <laughs> And he's desperate. Guys, the whole thing was a piece of meta theater. <laughs> Just to tell that story. Uh, but yes, there's, there's a boy and his puppet and also his mother and various other characters. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you start to describe the plot of Hand to God, it can take a very long time because there's a lot of different aspects and a lot of it different It sounds like things. gibberish. Yeah, you, like, I, I just tell people, I'm like, it's... It's funny, it's moving, it's bloody, it's sexy, it's nothing if not entertaining. But like when you get into the plot, you're like, you have this, this kid and his mother, uh, the father in, their, in the family has recently passed away, and they're not having a, they're, they're not doing very well coping with his, his loss. And, um, and they, uh, the mother teaches a, a puppet ministry in this Lutheran church basement in Cypress, Texas. And... Um, they both start acting out in very different, extreme ways. And uh, in the course of all this, um, Jason, the kid, his sock puppet Tyrone, becomes possessed by the devil. Like you do. As they do. Yeah. Uh, but know. Rob, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you grew up in Cypress, Texas, and your mother did teach a puppet class in the basement of a church. Uh, is this uh, autobiographical? Absolutely not. I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> This is where I break that news to the world. Uh, no, yeah, I'm from Cypress, Texas. Uh, I was, my, my, my mother had a Christian puppet ministry in Cypress. The church is St. Saint, Saint John Lutheran. You can go there. It's on the Rob Askins tour. Um, and it was weird. It was deeply weird. Most of the time I have to tell people that I didn't make this shit up, that people do strange things in the middle of this country. Um, so I decided to write about it. <laughs> but you, 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 write about, you write about religion a lot, uh, not only in this play, but in a number of your other plays. Uh, why do you keep returning to that? Why, why is that so important to you? Um, religion is the central preoccupying narrative of my young life. Um, and I think uh, one of the interesting things to talk about in the postmodern condition is the narratives that we all live in. We ins live inside stories, and they're no longer the mono-narratives that used to dominate single cultures. They're now fractious. And so we, we live in a time of friction between these narratives. And the narrative that I grew up in used to be the dominant and is no longer, and it is experiencing frustration. And that makes it aggressive in ways that it has not been for hundreds of years. And I find that fascinating. <laughs> Can I drop this mic? Is that drop it? No, we still we have minutes left to go in this interview. Don't don't end it so fast. But uh, I I like hearing you talk about the play in these terms, uh, which are kind of suggestive of uh, I don't want to say a grad school seminar, but they have a little bit of that. Uh, I didn't go to grad school. Well, going to give a TED but, I mean, talk there's later. something there's something to that. You know, when I saw the show, I was struck by sort of what I would think of as a kind of neo Nietzschean overtone in some of the philosophical things that are being tossed out. And I wonder if these are things that you explicitly considered when you were writing them, whether the philosophical background of, of uh, these things were going. Because the play, just so you know, is uh, hilarious and full of wild puppet sex and violence. Uh, but I think it w it's a mistake to just dismiss it as, as a funny puppet show. Yes. <laughs> Fair. Okay, so Stephen... <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you play both characters, or are they one character? How do you think of Jason um, and Tyrone the Hand they're, Puppet? They're two separate characters. It's, it's, you know, it's written as dialogue. It's not written as a monologue, though. I mean, you, can, you could think about it that way. I mean, some of these scenes, it's just between Jason and Tyrone, but it's written as dialogue. They are two completely separate characters, completely different brains and wants and desires. How did you rehearse that as an actor? Did you, did you sort of rehearse the, 
the two parts separately and then combine them? You or know, did you... we tried to rehearse them separately and it just didn't work so well. Like, it, the, the hardest thing about rehearsing it was that you don't have a free hand to hold your pages. So we had to set up these like music stands like around the stage and because you know it's I both the hands are taken up controlling the puppet and and so when I'm searching for a line it's like I just have to find one of these music stands and be like where am I somebody throw and you know it was it, that was the weirdest thing but when we we tried to do the bedroom scene you know the scene where Tyrone first becomes sentient and uh, and uh, the bedroom scene. Uh, we tried it a couple times where I would just do a run through as Jason or just do a run through as Tyrone and it felt it felt too fractious I mean it was there was something about it that was like I I it almost made more sense to me to keep them together um, even though they are so different I mean they are flip sides of the coin so uh, but it it just it somehow proved easier to rehearse them at the same time. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Rob? There is a long literary tradition of the divided <laughs> self in narrative. <laughs> Neo Nietzschean. Um, let us talk about it. It's difficult to be a acculturated human being. There is a, a dividing line in monotheism that doesn't exist in polytheism. Hey, um, <laughs> when you get down to one God, you've either got right or wrong. That leaves no appeal down the middle. It gets really rough. I would say that anxiety is the result, right? So many different people in literature have discussed this in many different ways in many different genres. We got Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, we got Lenny and what's his name? Uh, Twiggy. Thank yeah, Lenny you. and Squiggy. Lenny and Squiggy. <laughs> of Mice and Men. You guys know what I'm talking about. We got the brothers in True West, right? Uh, this anxiety is never ending. Uh, we even got Christ, who is very God and very man. Um, so this dialogue has been going f uh, on back and forth in, in the culture and in the narrative itself for conservatively, I would say, the last two or 3,000 years. Um, so I think that's why it's hard to rehearse one and not the other. Yeah, they need each other. Well, and Tyrone has been sort of the hand puppet. Tyrone has become kind of a breakout star of Hand to God. He's certainly the face of Hand to God and all the advertisements uh, and has a very active social media presence, uh, which is surprising. How does that come about? Uh, how does Tyrone... How do you generate this material for Tyrone, and who does it? I, when, they, when we found out the show was going to Broadway, I'm like, well, I don't know if they're going to recast me. I know they're going to sign Tyrone on. <laughs> I hope they bring me, too. Um, yeah, it's, he has, like, a life of his own. He's... It really grows out of boredom. <laughs> like, when I get bored during rehearsal, I just <laughs> sign up for another social media site <laughs> as Tyrone. And it's just like, uh, I find it really cool. OK Cupid, I think, was the one I got the most thrill out of. <laughs> yeah, we Although, did, we, did we a haven't video. done any of the swipe sites. We did a video for uh, Puppet Mingle. Yeah, Puppetmingle.com. Yeah, we did. But there's kind of a divided self within Tyrone, too, because in the social media stuff, at least, it seems as though we're seeing the social media profile sometimes of the actor playing Tyrone. Yeah, Tyrone McCansley, the personality who's playing Tyrone in <laughs> Hand to God. It's like he's, he's a different, he's kind of like a drunken, drug-addicted, womanizing asshole. <laughs> and, and he happens to be the star of a Broadway show. Uh, do you have any puppet background yourself? I, d I did a show called Jolly Ship the Whiz Bang. Uh, written by Nick Jones. It was at Ars Nova, and I had to learn to do some puppet stuff for that show. Um, and that was two years before we did our first reading, I think. So that was my that was my intro to puppet stuff. And and you? Uh, aside from my mother having the puppet ministry, uh, I was held back between kindergarten and first grade because I was immature. <laughs> When that happened, the counselor would explain the situation with a puppet. The puppet was a dolphin. 
the dolphin's name was Duso, and we would have to sing to Duso so that Duso would come out of his cave, which was made of cardboard. This had a particular effect on me. <laughs> this is like the primal scene. And this then, is the Freudian primal scene of Fine to God. And then, uh, and then uh, when I got into college, I was also into, I painted before I ever um, was involved in the theater. I painted, and then I acted, and then I was, uh, just started, started to write plays. And I went to Prague and studied with a Czech sonographer named Petr Matasek, and he did a lot of puppet work. So, and then I forgot about it for a very, very long time, and then I wrote this play. But now this play, just to give a little background on it, the first time I saw it was in 2011, I want to say, at uh, the Ensemble Studio Theater, and then I saw it again last year off-Broadway at MCC, at, at the Lortel, and then um, and now it's moved to Broadway, it moved in March. How... Uh, first of all, how surprising or was it surprising to you that it continued to have, because most off-Broadway shows with limited runs just end and don't come back two years later uh, in, more, in a very similar production. And also, I wonder if you could speak to how the show changed along the, along the way on those steps. You want to take it? I mean, I'm surprised every day that we're on Broadway. I'm like, who let us in? This is like, I totally feel like every day I'm like, somebody fucked up. <laughs> We're, we sh what are we doing here? And, and I mean, not that, you know, there shouldn't be more shows like Hand to God on Broadway, because I think there should, but it's just so out of the box. I mean, it's just not what tourists expect when they go see a play, you know? They don't expect to laugh their ass off and be challenged. Like, it's, it's just not, you know, Broadway's usually very comforting, and this is kind of... Not that. Um, but, uh, but has it changed? you want to talk about how it's changed? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would like to very quickly say that I am not surprised <laughs> by where it is. I feel like the energy around the first several productions was such that it just felt like something special. It changed a lot. It primarily changed in the second act. We did a lot of heavy lifting. The last 10 minutes was the battlefield upon which this war was fought. Endings are hard. Endings are real hard. Yeah. Um, so was the second sex scene between, spoiler alert, uh, anyway, there's, uh, there's a lot of sex, so that won't mean much to you. There is a second sex scene between two characters, which also took a lot of time and effort. But also, guys, comedy is music. And it's really hard music and especially one with such dynamic shifts from loud to soft to loud again to... It's like EDM. It is. It's like, it's like Skrillex. Um, <laughs> so it took a lot, I think, of very precise orchestration, both on the part of the actors, myself, and Mr. Moritz von Stupnagel, who is not with us right now, to He's really... still alive. Just to, just to clarify that. <laughs> He's not on this stage. Has the, the best name on Broadway, also. He absolutely does. It's a Wes Anderson character. Also the best name in my heart. <laughs> well, but the tonal, con you know, there are so many radical tonal shifts in this show. It goes, you know, the pendulum moves so widely. Uh, and I wonder if, if that's harder to control on Broadway. I, when I saw it, the audience was uproarious with laughter, you know. But I, I have a friend who saw it and said that at intermission, the couple in front of him turned around to him and shushed him and said, do you mind keeping, you're laughing, and it's disturbing us while we watch the show. Because <laughs> they were laughing during the show. On Broadway? Or on Broadway. On the Broadway, yeah. They, they're, they, not, they're not used to people actually expressing their joy when they go to see a Broadway <laughs> show. They're like, usually we sit here and think, how much did we pay for these tickets? Not doing this again. Yeah. My, my dream is that we do a BYOB balcony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> BYOB balcony, and then just let it get crazy, like the infield at NASCAR. No, but it's funny because a lot of people now talk about the theater as a church or as a temple and talk about this reverence that we have to have for this holy space in which the actors express themselves. Even that was something that people brought up during the whole fracas over the, over the plugging in and the rest of it, or the cell phone that went off on, at a different show. Uh, do you think that is a good model for the theater, that sort of reverent, uh, silent, respectful model? Take it. <laughs> yes, as long as it is ameliorated 
uh, abrogated by the Seder play. Our earliest models of this are three tragedies and then a very nasty dick and fart joke farce. That's what they did at the Festival Dionysian. It was a trilogy of tragedy and then a comedy. And we do not see enough of that explosive acknowledgement of our difficulty to control our bodies in the sacred space. It makes us feel alienated, and it makes me very angry. <laughs> Rise up. Uh, Stephen, uh, this yes. is, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, I, I will <laughs> just come right out and say I think that the performance that Stephen Boyer is giving in this show is one of the great stage performances I have seen in 20 years of theater going. Uh, just an absolute astonishment. And I want to, I, I, for you to get up there and do that uh, eight times a week, uh, how is that sustainable? I mean that not in a, in a hyperbolic way. I, I literally mean how do you, how do you bring that every uh, day, eight times a week, and how do you uh, keep the energy up after doing it for four months in a row on Broadway? I, I had a, a teacher way back when who called actors emotional athletes, and I was always kind of like, that's not true. And now I feel like I get it. I understand, because this is a marathon. It's like I, you know, running this play, I mean, we're in our sixth month, and eight shows a week. We just passed, you know, 120-some performances, and it's just like, I... It's, how, how is it sustainable? I'm still figuring out how to sustain this. I mean, every day it's like, what do I need to do all day today to make sure that I'm able to do the show tonight? And now we're getting into weekends where we're doing it twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday. And it is just, it's like I've lost between 15 and 20 pounds and it's not coming back. Like I keep like eating and eating and I'm like, it's not coming back. I'm just, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. It feels like it, it's changed my entire life. And, and then, you know, how to sustain it emotionally for that period of time. I was talking to Geneva Carr, who plays the mother, Marjorie, in the show, and, and her and I both feel the same way, which is the play is so rich that we can keep doing it eight times a week for month after month and keep discovering new bits about the characters. You know, we discover new little gems and new lines that resonate with us, and there's new reasons to feel, you know, frustration and anger with each other, or like sadness at, at the loss of my father, and it's, there's just new, there's so much to explore that it, it, it has yet to run out. There's still, there's still gas in the tank. Well, speaking of crazy marathon experiences, uh, this year's Tony season was the most insane in recent memory. Uh, all of the shows were crowded into the last month of the Broadway season. So literally 40% of all shows that opened on Broadway opened in the last three weeks of the Broadway season. Um, and no, it was true. Uh, and then, so I'm wondering for you guys, how did you navigate, because you're opening the show, an incredibly demanding show, and suddenly there are also all of these, the show was nominated for five Tony Awards, including for best play and for best lead actor in a play. So, I'm wondering, how many events did you have to go to? How did you sustain that energy? And is that, is that sort of, uh, is that sort of a downside of, of working on Broadway in that time of year? I don't know how many events we went to. I sort of like, I, 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 I blacked out that entire month. <laughs> I was just, I left my body and just, I, I have no idea what happened. Um, we were, you know, still doing eight show weeks and they would, we would go to like two, sometimes three different events where we, they're like, you have to wear a suit to this. This is casual suit to this. Make sure you wear different suits. Make sure you say these, but, and it's like, well, I, it, at a certain point I kind of felt like I'd never been a part of like an awards campaign, but these things are campaigned for heavily. And it is crazy. I felt like I was in, at a certain point, I felt like I was in, uh, in uh, House of Cards, but, I, but I, wasn't, I wasn't Francis Underwood, I was Claire. <laughs> I was just like, yes, Francis, whatever you say. And uh, it was, it, I've never experienced anything like it. It was so <laughs> unbelievably exhausting. I liked it. <laughs> you didn't have to do the show at night. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, do you, still, do you still work at night? Because in the initial spate of interviews this year, at least, uh, there was a lot of talk about how you were still a bartender in Brooklyn uh, in the evening. Are you still doing that? 
Uh, I kept my Thursday and my Sunday, but I've been doing so much traveling this summer that my guys have been picking up the slack. I'm hoping to go back to it in the fall. And with that, <laughs> living the Broadway dream, we will move uh, to uh, questions from the audience, if there are any. Sir. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hey. What's going um, on, man? So I've seen the show four times now, and I'm going back for the fifth time next week. Um, I'm officially a convert to the Church of Hand to God. Awesome. Um, <laughs> um, one of the great thrills as an audience member seeing your show is to hear the audience reaction uh, specifically to some of the scenes later in the show. I was hoping you could talk about, um, as an actor and a playwright, uh, what it's like to sit in the audience with people and hear them uh, react to what's going on on stage. I, I, I used to be, I used to be uh, a comic for a while. And so, you know, as, as a comedian, I love to, like, play the audience's laughter and like surf those laughs and you do much of that for most you know most of the time in hand to god you're you're surfing and playing the audience's laughs which is awesome and then there are these moments that sneak up on the audience that we know are coming but they don't necessarily know we're coming that just punch them in the gut and we i so i like i love to hear them laugh and i love to hear them scream and I love it when they gasp. I, we, I've had people, people just, people yell out things. They're like, it's like they're in a horror movie, you know? They're like, they're like, no, no, no! It's just like, people have these amazing reactions where they're just like warning us, you know, not to go in there. And it's, uh, it's, it's just awesome. I've never done anything where people react that way. And I, God, I love it. I spend a little bit of time as a preacher. And... <laughs> There is nothing like hearing the sound you want to come up from the congregation. And it makes you feel like you're doing your job, and it makes you feel like they needed it. And some of those sounds, when we get to the end of the play, it's like an hallelujah. People came to get saved, and we saved them. <laughs> uh. Sir. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be saved. I thought the show was fantastic. You're both so phenomenal at what you do. I'm curious to know, where do you start? Like, what was the seedling for the play? Was it having this puppet? Was it um, the character that you wrote for uh, Stephen? And Stephen, where do you start when you get a script? <laughs> um, we worked together at a place called EST for a very long time. Um, and I got to know Steve's work pretty well. I would see Steve do a lot of one acts, readings of full lengths, all of that kind of thing. And the thing that's difficult to understand about a single play is that it always exists in a trajectory of work in conversation with other work. Not only the work historically, but the work personally. I've got maybe 12 unproduced full lengths, right? And this is just one point in the conversation, right? It was kind of a point where I decided to make some different choices, where I was like, what if we embrace the comedy wholeheartedly, right? What if growing up in the South, growing up in Texas isn't as sad as I thought it was? What if it's just weird? Do you know what I mean? And um, I guess that that allowed for the, for the birth of Tyrone. Um, but there was also an element of it where we were at a party, and I looked over and saw Steve and Geneva sitting together, and it's just a weird, magical thing that happens sometimes when you see a fellow artists, and you're like, oh, God, that's right. Like, that's why the company system, that's why hanging out with people who you respect, I feel like, is really great. Like, I had a moment like that the other day. I was walking through Red Hook, and I saw Michael Shannon. And I was like, oh, Michael Shannon. And a moment came to me of a play. So, Michael Shannon, if you're watching this, give me a call. <laughs> Let's make some magic. Uh, 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 Sir. My, my answer to that uh, it was very boring. It's, I, I, I approach the script to hand to God just like I approach every other script, which was just, you know, read it and try not to embarrass myself. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah. 
This, this was a little different because I was, like, I was like, if I screw this up, people are just going to be laughing at me and not with me. I'm like, this is a monumental challenge that Rob has put in front of me, so I, I better try and get this right. Um, but it's, you know, approaching it like a anything else, just kind of like trying to get to the heart of what the character wants and what's in their way. Sir. So this question is directed towards Steven. Um, you mentioned briefly that um, when you were doing rehearsals that uh, it felt awkward to kind of do it with just you and not Tyrone. Mm. And my question is, do you think because there's so much of opposites that they kind of need each other? Like, I, it's a broad comparison, but I think like Batman, Joker, they need each other in order to feed each other's energy. So I just wanted to see, do you think it was because Tyrone was such, such an out there character? Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, Tyrone does not exist without Jason, and Jason can't exist without Tyrone on some level, and there are parts in the play where Tyrone, for whatever reason, sort of disappears, and that those aspects of Jason's personality that are funneled through Tyrone finally come together in Jason, and you see, like, the complete range of what his emotional life could be, and... Uh, and it's like when, but when they're divided, which they are for most of the play, you, yeah, I think they absolutely need each other because they are, they are, they're like, you know, they, they, they dovetail into each other and uh, complement each other. And, you know, Tyrone would tell Jason, you complete me. So, yeah. And you've played all sorts of crazy characters in your time. I only play the most fucked up characters. <laughs> That's what I do. I have seen him as a chimpanzee on stage, uh, uh, as Lear's fool. And you played Michael J. Fox for a while, didn't you? I, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of Michael J. Fox impressions. I do a lot of impressions, and, <laughs> but that one probably the most. We have two more questions. Oh, uh, ma'am. Does Tyrone ever come out and do interviews? And do you have the permission and or the capacity to improvise with him? I do. I, I do. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he does interviews. And, you know, it's like Rob pretty much is like the written word Tyrone. But then when Tyrone is, like, live and having to do interviews and things, I do his voice and his body. So, you know, it's like it, it really taps into the, the stand-up comic in me. Then, and it's just like, you know, it's... It's this comedic persona that's that's just so tempting, and I I I, I love being Tyrone Tyrone McHansley, the the actor version of Tyrone, the offstage Tyrone. And you know, I got to host the Drama League Awards this year, and they were like, "Yeah, we want Tyrone to co-host." I'm like, "Okay." Um, <laughs> uh, how about I, how about he just comes in for a while and roasts everyone because he wasn't nominated so that's that's what he ended up doing so I got to like roast Helen Mirren and Carrie Mulligan and it was great it was awesome you really gave one of the best performances in the last five years that I've seen coming to Broadway so thank you very much um, thank you it, it, And I think you're, I think you're going to answer it the way I, most people are, oh, were you disappointed because you knew you had given such a great performance that you did not win the Tony? And secondly, I saw the show twice, and the first time I went, I was like, oh, it's a good show, but after you go to the show, it sinks in. And do you get that kind of comment a lot, that you, know, you have to see it a couple of times to really, really appreciate the depth and the, and the performance itself? Um. Yeah, uh, well, um, as far as the Tonys go, I think, you know, I think everybody would like to win a Tony. I mean, that'd be, that'd be nice. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, not like, it's not like all or nothing. I mean, the fact that the show was on Broadway, the fact that the show was nominated for so many Tonys, the fact that so many people saw it and had such an amazing reaction like you've had is is uh, that, like none of that would have been possible with, without all of these, the confluence of all these things coming together. So, you know, the, the Tonys would have been a nice cherry, but it's not the end goal, you know, which is the goal is to tell stories and influence people. And so we're still doing that. 
so uh, you know, people's people's reactions are are kind of like that's the best thing. I'll tell you what the audi audience reaction out outside the stage door. They're pissed. <laughs> that's I like. I don't need to be upset because they're they're plenty upset for me, which is kind of nice and terrifying. It's like. I, I realize that the Tonys bring out this weird competitive nature where it's like in theater as as artists we don't it's like it's like rooting for your favorite sports team it's like you know we're it's like a lot of people in theater aren't the biggest sports fans so they have the Tonys and <laughs> and the Tonys people are like oh then my show better win if it doesn't oh that other show sucks and so people just get crazy they get it's like you know they're showing up in their team colors and like yeah it's amazing it's amazing how 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 fervent uh, Broadway fans can be. Yeah, the roving gangs of fans that clash at intermission. It gets ugly out <laughs> yeah, there, Yeah, in guys. Schubert Alley, there's like rumbles. Right. It's amazing. You should it's see ugly. when we fight against the Matilda fans. Oh, the blood. Oh, it's terrible. I forget what the second part of your question was. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. We, we, you know, there are a lot of people that come back and see the show multiple times. And because they want to bring friends, they're like, I want to need to show people, you know, they, I have friends that think that they don't like theater, but they just haven't seen this. And they, they bring people, you know, they, they want to expose people to the show and they come back and come back. And it's funny, the second time people see it, they always say the same thing. They're like, this was my second time. So this time when Tyrone was talking, I watched Jason's face. <laughs> and it's like, ev everyone says that. It's so, it's so strange and it's so strangely predictable now it's very it's weird it's like people are like it's my second time seeing it so and i and i know what they're gonna say it's uh it's amazing but yeah there's a lot to get i mean there's just so many layers to the show and to these characters and and you can relate to each one on different levels so i i think you know like your favorite movie or tv show it bears repeated viewings all right, and that is all the time we have. Do go see if you haven't seen it, or if you want to see it again and again and again. Uh, do go see Hand to God on Broadway. It is a, truly, I think, the funniest and freshest Broadway comedy in years, uh, and you will enjoy it, I promise. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stephen.